Mandatory minicamp for the Carolina Panthers has come and gone. Let's go ahead and wrap up this week with another edition of the weekly Friday mailbag right here on Locked On Panthers. You are Locked On Panthers, your daily Carolina Panthers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On Panthers podcast, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, as always, Julian Council, talking Carolina Panthers with you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We had five episodes this week because mandatory minicamp was going on, and I had to give you all some content, had news to talk about, had things to talk about as well with all of the press conferences and the Panthers being out on the field for the last time until five weeks from now when they'll be down in Spartanburg, South Carolina once again at Wofford College for training camp. And I guess one of the uh, nice things about the new facility in Rock Hill not coming to uh, fruition is that the Panthers will continue a long tradition of starting off their season there at Wofford College, the home of the Terriers and where former owner Jerry Richardson went to college. I'm happy that's still going to go on. It's going to be very hot, as it always is down there in Rock Hill. And they got a glimpse of it this past week in Charlotte. It was a scorcher. Now, there's not an indoor facility at Wofford, so they're not going to be able to get away from the heat once they get down there in late July and early August. But again, guys, make sure to subscribe to the show here on YouTube and watch the show every single episode is there on YouTube. And you can also subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast and all your favorite podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, Stitcher, all of those places and more. Great review and subscribe to Locked On Panthers so you don't miss a single episode throughout the next coming summer months as we'll be on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays here on the show. And be sure to follow me on Twitter at Julian Council, where every single Friday I answer weekly Friday mailbag questions to participate either at me at Julian Council or just more easily just DM me at Julian Council and I'll get to your weekly Friday mailbag questions like I'm going to do right now here on the show. Let's go ahead and start off this week with Luke. And Luke says, hey, Julian, hello, Luke. Hope you're doing well. I hope you're doing the same, Luke. Uh, getting my question in early for the weekly mailbag, I recently wrote an article for Cat Crave a uh, great publication, y'all. If you ever want to uh, check out some good Carolina Panthers content, he said, listening, he listened, he uh, listed, excuse me, um, his 10 worst draft picks in franchise history. Um, for his top 10, he had Ray Carruth at three, Jeff Ota at two, and then, of course, Jimmy Clausen at number one. Would love to get your opinion on who your top three are. Keep up the great work, buddy. You do a smashing job on the podcast. Thank you, Luke. I love anyone who says smashing. It's more of like, a, I don't know if Luke's from overseas, but uh, that's usually uh, kind of seems like a British term. But um, yeah, so I'll start from three to one. Now, Ota and Carruth were obviously both number one. They were both first round picks. Jimmy Clausen was a second round pick. And I get he was the first pick of the Panthers in that draft. And there was hope that Jimmy Clausen could be the franchise quarterback. Um, I'm going to cut him some slack because he was a second round pick. And traditionally, as I was looking through football reference in the first round picks the Carolina Panthers have had, they've typically done a really good job landing on their first rounders. Now, there have been some notable exceptions. Joe Jeff Ota is one of those, but injuries were his main problem, not necessarily whether he could play or not. So I'm going to cut him some slack. My top three, starting off with number three, Vernon Butler, who was rightfully slandered pretty much his entire time here in Carolina. It took until his final year here a couple years ago. We had six and a half sacks where Vernon Butler started to play the football that we hoped he would when he was drafted in the first round out of Louisiana Tech. Now, when he was taken by then uh, the hog father, <laughs> um, David Gettleman, who loved his hog mollies, it did make a lot of sense. They had already brought in a free agent from Atlanta who was at defensive tackle they had brought in. Um, God, I can't remember his name, but it didn't really make sense. Like, why would you sign someone in free agency who can start at that position and then draft someone in the first round? Vernon Butler was lazy a lot of the time, obviously not hardworking, just did not pan out. And then he went to Buffalo. I don't think he's there anymore. So Vernon Butler would be my number three. Number two, let's take it back to 2000. The first round pick for the Carolina Panthers was a corner, Rashard Anderson. He only played in 27 games here in Carolina, nine starts, all coming in his second year, and one career interception. Anderson then followed up by being suspended for a full year by the NFL um, for violating the NFL substance abuse policy. He came back in 03 only to be cut and then landed in the Arena League, and that was it for his NFL career. 
I would say he's the second worst that what that they've ever had. Like, do even people even remember Richard Anderson? Probably not. And then number one, I mean, it's not, of course, Jimmy Clausen. It's got to be Ray Carruth. Like on the field, good player would have been a really good player here. But what he did off the field is reprehensible. Now he's paid his debt to society. He's now a free man. But obviously, anyone who comes out there and does what he does deserves to be the worst pick they've ever had here in franchise history. So interesting uh, little topic that you had there, Luke. And uh, people go check out Luke and all the folks over there at Cat Crave as they uh, do good work. Um, moving on now to Rod, uh, who asked, should the Panthers convert Christian McCaffrey to wide receiver? CMC's body doesn't seem to be holding up as a feature back with 300-pound guys falling on him. Moving to slot wide receiver would not only extend his career, I think he would be Wes Welker 2.0 and dominate the league considering – Foreman, Hubbard, and an improved offensive line, I feel the backfield will be just fine. And that's a good point you make there. When they brought in Shuba Hubbard last year out of the fourth round, in the fourth round out of Oklahoma State with the uh, hopes that he could be a solid backup, especially if Christian McCaffrey missed time like he did in 2020, and he did miss time. Now, he's clearly not Christian McCaffrey. And then Panthers are, one. I think, maybe the only team in the NFL to have three players on the roster who were 2,000-yard rushers back in college. McCaffrey at Stanford, Hubbard at Oklahoma State against Matt Rule in that Baylor team, and uh, Deontay Foreman from Texas, which is an interesting thing. So Foreman was really good last year, filling in for Derrick Henry, but neither one of those guys is better than Chris McCaffrey as running backs. Like, can they hold up? I mean, Foreman was, like, out of the league not very long ago, and now he's back here after a really good stint with the Titans, and Hubbard, not great out of the backfield when it comes to catching the football, which is why you brought up the, uh, the idea of Chris McCaffrey playing wide receiver. I don't think they need to do that. They can split them out wide more often if that's something they think can help the team moving forward. But as far as extending his career, like running back position is just what it is. You're going to have injuries. All the top paid running backs have these sort of injuries. It's why I've said running backs should be making federal minimum wage and why you probably shouldn't invest in a running back, even though I think Christian McCaffrey is a phenomenal talent and I want to keep him back there at running back and still get 20 carries per game for him. Just maybe tell Sam Darnold, whoever playing his quarterback, to stop checking it down to him 10 times a game and he wouldn't have as many touches. And I guess you could still keep him off the field. But I would say no. And let's go back to his injuries. Like Daniel Sorensen, the, I think, former safety of the Chiefs, he is the one who hurt his shoulder back in 2020. He doesn't weigh 300 pounds. Uh, Chris McCaffrey pulled his hamstring. No 300-pounder fell on him. And then when he got hurt in, I think, week two or three uh, back in 2020 at Tampa Bay, I don't believe – it wasn't a 300-pounder that landed on him. Like, these things happen. doesn't matter what position you play. Yes, running back, you take the most hits, and it's far more likely you're going to get injured. But it could happen with one single play where you can be out for the rest of the season regardless of your position. So I don't think they need to move him out to wide receiver permanently – or primarily, but they can certainly try and mix things up with this offense and new and McAdoo's new system and try to get Chris McCaffrey in those situations where a lot of these linebackers, as we've seen in those choice routes that he runs out of the backfield, just cannot mess with this guy. And I think he would be a really good player at wide receiver if he needed to ever do that. I just don't think that necessarily needs to be what the Panthers' plan is with for him moving forward. Uh, all right, let's move on to our next one. Um, we got Ryan. Uh, what's up, Julian? Ryan here. Love the show. Thank you. Uh, here's one for the Friday mailbag coming across from the pond in Ireland. By the way, it was awesome hearing you on my brother's podcast last week. Yeah, guys. So I went on a podcast um, in Ireland uh, last week. And the funny thing about it is I think it's the under center podcast. I don't want to get this wrong. Let me go make sure I go find uh, my Twitter and don't uh, credit the wrong people because I, I should know this. It was the yes, the under center podcast and center spelled the uh, the old English way. Uh, those guys do a great job. Um, and they actually had Ron Rivera on Thursday. So they had me on last week, and then they had Ron Rivera on. So I'm not really understanding how the hell they, why they asked me to go on their podcast. Yeah, they wanted me to talk Panthers, but come on. Me, Ron Rivera, two different uh, classes there. So really cool what those guys are doing, and awesome that they're getting a head coach. Like, what? Um, either way. But his question is, in a hypothetical situation where Matt Corral is our best option going into the 2023 season at quarterback and is still struggling to read NFL defenses, which is possible given the offense he came out of in Mississippi, do you think he possesses the physical traits to run a quick read RPO system similar to what we ran with Cam in year one? And if so, do you think he could be effective in a scheme like that given McAdoo's history of RPO and his offensive schemes? Apologies for the long question. Cheers. No. Cheers to you, Ryan. Um, 
okay, so we're, here's a major difference when we're looking at Cam Newton and Matt Corral. Cam Newton's like 6'6", 260. Matt Corral's six foot two five, something like that. Like completely different ballpark when it comes to the physical specimen in Adonis and Greek godlike figure that that Cam Newton is to what Matt Corral is today. And he'll put on more weight and he'll strengthen up. And hopefully by next year, he's ready to take a full toll if he has to of an NFL season. I mean, depending, of course, how many hits he takes. You don't want to take any hits at all, but still that he can hold up. And as far as the RPO system goes, we've seen how some of these college RPOs have come into the NFL. And it's going to be a part of the Panther system now with Ben McAdoo and with Sam Darnold. And it will be a part of whatever offensive system that you see here in the NFL, regardless of what team it is, whether it's in Carolina, Kansas City, um, New England, and across the league. Like, you're going to have it. Now, maybe like with Tom Brady, you're probably not going to really run a lot of those concepts in Tampa Bay because he's not a threat to run the ball. But, yeah, you can run that with Matt Corral. So we'll see. And I think a big part of it is, as I talked about with you all yesterday, um, after they wrapped up mandatory minicamp and he spoke to the media and he said it's about the mental part of the game and, and being able to catch up with the speed of the game, which you're really not at full speed just yet, but trying to learn the playbook. And it's between, it's after the whistle and then getting to that next snap of just figuring out how to operate the offense pre-snap. And that's what Matt Rules brought up. That's what Ben McAdoo has brought up. And he can have a full season waiting behind Sam Darnold. That would only have him, I think, prepared to go into it in 2023. Now, game experience is vital in this key. And I don't know how much he's going to get this upcoming season. There's a good chance that he will get some, just considering that Sam Darnold has, well, not played well over the course of his first four seasons. He also hasn't stayed healthy over the course of his first four seasons in the NFL. Now, will be PJ Walker gets an opportunity? I don't know. But Matt Corral, hopefully at some point this season, if needed to be called upon for a backup, hopefully it would be him as in he's ready to go. But they're not going to rush him out there unless they really truly think he's ready. And, of course, the best option to help this team win games this upcoming season. So I, that's what I would say to your question. Like, I think just give him time to learn and develop and whatever system we're going to run, I think would actually have those RPOs that he certainly became accustomed to and very confident in and played at a high level at um, in Lane Kiffin's offense this past year in the last two years, actually. Uh, down at Ole Miss. All right, take a quick pause here on the show. Then I'll come back and answer more of your weekly Friday mailbag questions here on this edition of Locked On Panthers. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. Find all of the latest sports developments, news, and odds, including this year's NBA Finals. I'm recording this on Thursday, so I have no idea whether Golden State wrapped it up or not. Either way, if it's going on still, make sure to check out the odds there. The Stanley Cup Finals as the... Colorado Avalanche. Yeah, that's the team. Uh, they won in overtime in game one against the two-time defending Stanley Cup champions, uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning. Also got Major League Baseball and, of course, all the latest fighting news from MMA and UFC. The boxing and the U.S. Open going on at the Country Club in Brookline, Massachusetts. Phil Mickelson getting absolutely detonated in your face. Bet online is continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online where the game starts. Okay, let's get back to the questions here on this edition of the weekly Friday mailbag here on Locked On Panthers. Next up is Tanner, who says maybe a fun question would be what would Cleveland actually swap for Sam Darnold? A ham sandwich. I don't, and I talked about this yesterday on the show. A lot of Panther fans, and I, I don't think it's a crazy thing to bring up, have brought up the fact that, hey, Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield are both on their fifth-year options this upcoming season. Both of them are making $18.858 million. If you want to round up, $18.9 million, nearly $19 million and $38 million guaranteed for two quarterbacks who probably aren't ever going to be franchise quarterbacks ever for any team in the National Football League. Sam Darnold's already failed in New York. Currently, he's not doing so great here in Carolina. And Cleveland has moved off to Baker Mayfield to go get an adult. That being Deshaun Watson, who has 24 civil cases against him, alleging uh, sexual misconduct and assault when receiving massages. And he has seen 66, 66, se over 17 months, 66 different massage therapists. That is insane. Like, that is just so completely out of bounds. Like, great reporting by Jenny Rentis, But that's who they believe is an adult compared to Baker Mayfield. So, hey, that's Cleveland's deal. And the thing of what that is, Deshaun Watson might not play this season. I don't know. The Browns set up his contract to the point where he doesn't, he wouldn't lose any money this year, really, if he got suspended. And with more lawsuits coming out against him, 
it feels like Deshaun Watson could miss the entire season, which would mean he would miss two straight seasons in the middle of his prime. But the Browns are betting on Deshaun Watson being there still after that for the next 10, 12 years and delivering whatever uh, to Cleveland, the mistake by the lake up there on Lake Erie. Uh, but if he's going to be out for an extended period of time, Jacoby Reset would be the backup quarterback. But behind him is Josh Dobbs, who, if Brissett gets injured, the Browns would be pretty screwed if that was their starting quarterback the rest of the way. Love Josh Dobbs, was awesome at Tennessee, spent time with Pittsburgh and the Steelers, was like an aerospace engineer at Tennessee. Like, I really don't know why the dude plays in the NFL right now. Like, love football you want. You're not even playing. Like, go to NASA. Go help out our country that way. You're not helping out yourself or anybody by playing football. But they want someone maybe better than Josh Dobbs. So the thought is, hey, Browns swap uh, like for like, which is – they're not alike. Make Baker's way better than Sam Darnold if you watch both of them play so far in their careers. Well, yeah, bring in Sam Darnold. Let him be an $18.9 million third string quarterback. Like, think of the idea of Deshaun coming in, coming back, and being QB1. Then Brissett at QB2. And then Sam Darnold making more than both of those guys combined this upcoming season in Cleveland. The, the, the probability of that happening might be very low, depending on what the NFL decides to do with Deshaun Watson. I just don't see how Cleveland really gains anything from that. Like, let's trade a, our better quarterback for a worse quarterback who's making a contract that's the same, but certainly in his circumstances is far worse than with Baker. Because Baker at least earned a fifth-year option where the Panthers were like, well, we gave up these assets, and we believe in Sam Darnold. At least we have to show we believe in Sam Darnold, so let's go ahead and give him the fifth-year option, even though we haven't seen him play. And anytime anyone's seen him play, he's been particularly bad. So I. I, I don't see why Cleveland would do that. And Mary Kay Cabot, as I mentioned yesterday, um, from the Cleveland Plain, Plain Dealer in Cleveland.com, she had wrote and reported that it's unlikely that happens. Like, for Cleveland, Andrew Barry, didn't he, like, go to Harvard or something like that? Or Princeton, one of those? Seems like he's a smart guy. That would be idiotic, in my opinion, to swap Baker Mayfield for Sam Darnold. Come on. Um, but, yeah, fun question. <laughs> no offense, Tanner. Uh, okay, move on to Mark. Hi, JC. Hi, Mark. Uh, Fitterer revealed post-draft that Willis and Pickett were never under consideration for the Panthers. He never mentioned Ritter. Ritter is bigger, more athletic, and more pro-ready than Corral. He is apparently quicker on the uptake, too, despite your thoughts on the Wonderlick, which I could care less about the Wonderlick scores. Um, Ritter has been – like, there's, like, two positions, and it's not – in quarterback's not one of them where the Wonderlick actually, like, just yeah, correlates to a success in the NFL. Either way, as he continues to say, Ritter has been praised by his coach on how fast he picked up the playbook. Meanwhile, Rule has stated that Corral has a long, long way to go on learning the offense. Do you think that Ritter was actually the Panthers' target and Corral was their plan B? The Panthers have tried to tell everybody who will listen um, that they want to develop Matt Corral slowly. Like, that's what they want to do. When they talk about bringing in, potentially trading for Baker Mayfield, that is signaling to you that they do not think that Matt Corral is going to be ready to start here in 2022. At some point, maybe he might get there, but they really want to play the long game with Matt Corral and develop him and not throw him out there before he's ready. Uh, I don't know what's going on in Atlanta with Desmond Ritter. I imagine Marcus Mariota is going to start, considering that he has experience in Arthur Smith's offense be, be, being back in Tennessee. Um, but I don't know what Atlanta is going to do. I know they're going to stink this year. It doesn't matter who plays quarterback that they're going to be a trash football team. Um, so I don't really care what's going on in Atlanta. As far as Ritter, the dude had the best college resume considering he took Cincinnati to the playoff first group of five program to do that. He was a three year starter, really good player. He's also someone who's a little bit raw and is going to have to, um, you know, obviously learn NFL system and the speed of the game and we'll see what happens. I don't know. And it, they're always going to be compared because they're in the same division. Uh, like, similar similar way how DJ Moore and Calvin Ridley were compared early on. And Panther fans are like, oh, why didn't we get Calvin Ridley? Well, things have worked out pretty damn well here in Carolina recently, haven't they? With Ridley leaving uh, last year because of personal reasons and then getting suspended for an entire year this upcoming season because he gambled on football, which I keep forgetting that happened. I think they made a, a good decision. So we'll see. And I don't know. I, I haven't read anywhere if Fitterer said that, like, that he, I mean, you say he never mentioned Ritter. Uh, I mean, are we going back to Panthers Confidential? Because they're only, that's only going to a snippet of the conversation. I don't, we never saw what their true quarterback board was. It seems like they favored Corral the most. Either way, he was a fourth quarterback taken in this draft and they had to trade up to go get him. Maybe they panicked. I don't know. A part of, when they say that, it makes you think that that was their guy. And that's what they want you to think anyway. Like there's a whole PR aspect of this. 
it seems like they like Matt Corral. It's very clear they do like Matt Corral. But was he the top of their board? I don't know. Pickett won the first round and, of course, has experience with Matt Rule. Well, barely, but still had that relationship. And, of course, Tepper is a Pittsburgh guy. I don't know. I don't know if Corral was plan B or not. All I'm doing, all I know is I'm looking at who got taken before him and seeing that he was the fourth quarterback taken. And then I'm just going to read between the lines, maybe think that it's possible that the Panthers like some of the other guys be ahead of him and that they still really like Matt Corral. And as Jonathan Alexander told us a couple weeks ago from the Charlotte Observer, they were still considering drafting Sam Howell to come in and potentially those two compete. So if Matt Corral's your guy, why would you consider that? Just, just thought, just thought. I don't know. I don't know. You got to ask them. But I, I haven't really heard anything about Willis or Pickett or Ritter from any of them other than like, we watched Panthers Confidential. I haven't read anything. Maybe there was something else I need to be checking out. So please, seriously, educate me. Point me in that way if I'm missing out. I don't know. Uh, again, let's move on. Uh, Abby, Friday mailbag question. How concerned should we be about Robbie Anderson in terms of his attitude slash locker room presence, early signs of injuries and readiness for the season? Do you think he's still a good fit for this team? Is it too early to tell? Everything we've seen with Robbie Anderson, as far as like how he's gotten along in the locker room, it seems like him and DJ Moore have a good relationship. Obviously, when Cam was here last year, they had a good, good relationship. What is his relationship with Sam Darnold? He can say whatever he wants about how he was defending Sam by saying nah to the whole Baker Mayfield deal because that's my quarterback. <sighs> a year ago, he was talking about the glow Sam Darnold had. He was glistening that he had never seen Sam like this now that he was out of the oppression that is in the New York Jets and that failing organization. And then he came to Carolina where – Still kind of in the doldrums of how things are. Um, but we'll see how things pan out eventually. But um, I, I, I don't I mean, yeah, there should be a level of concern. Anytime a player comes out and says he was th- he said he was thinking out loud and there was this thing going on personally where he's like, I might retire. But then he showed up and he said, I'm here, ain't I? Which is like a answer that anyone. That's the funny thing is like, hey, do you do you want to be here? And someone says, I'm here, ain't I? Isn't necessarily a ringing endorsement of how much they how much they love their job (laughs) anyone who hates their job responds in that way and i guess i don't want to necessarily put that blanket statement over robbie anderson hating being here but typically if you're really happy where you're at you're you don't give a defensive answer like that like i'm here ain't i it's like uh, or maybe it's a a, a smart aleck answer I, i i don't know it seems to be a fine locker room presence uh, he really hasn't had injuries. He hasn't. I don't. I don't remember him missing any time so far. And I think. I think he'll be ready. He missed. Like, here's the thing, too. He missed all of mandatory main camp last year, and, and a large part. He well, not. He didn't miss mandatory main camp. He missed a, a decent portion of the offseason program last year. It didn't have a good season, and then it, and then followed it up by not being here. And he's behind with the playbook. You question that with five weeks, but he's a professional, and you would hope and think that he'd be ready to go. And Matt Rule has at least outwardly not express any concern in terms of Robbie's readiness. So it's just, here's the thing. Rashard Higgins was making plays the other day and he has experience in this league. Terrace Marshall, everyone's saying great things about him and he has loads more potential than Robbie Anderson even has. Hope that those guys can step up and play well. Because either way, I I look at this as maybe Robbie's last year. Like the Panthers financially, next offseason can get out of his contract. Now, because they restructured the deal with the signing bonuses, the dead cap hits can be more than it would have been. Like you're looking at a dead cap hit, whether they trade or release him. doesn't matter whether it's pre-June 1st or post-June 1st. It's going to be $9.7 million of dead money. But they can save $12 million, whether they trade or cut Robbie Anderson. Again, either pre-June 1st or post-June 1st. So you have to weigh with, with whether you'd want to save twelve million dollars or whether you or you want to or you're cool eating the nine. That's kind of the deal too with that with uh, Robbie Anderson. It also depends on how the wide receivers like Marshall play this upcoming. Really, how Terrace Marshall plays, and then I mean, there's college receivers coming out of every year that are spectacular, and you can go draft whether in the first, second, or third round, and even fourth round, I can come out there and make plays for you. So I, I kind of look at this as potentially Robbie's last year. So I don't know how much we should be concerned about it. I think it'll potentially be fine, but it certainly is a uh, it's a mild concern. It's not a great concern, but it's it's a mild concern based off what we saw last year. Okay, let's take one more quick pause here on the show, and I'll come back and answer the rest of your weekly Friday mailbag questions here on Locked On Panthers. 
This episode of Locked On Panthers is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand or house happens to carry. Get computers of access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket, folks. I'm talking about your smartphone, whether it's an Apple or it's a Samsung. Who has those? Galaxies, uh, boo. Um, you have access to Rock Auto. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Rock Auto is a family business serving you do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer. They have everything you can need from brake parts, tear lamps, motor oil, and even new carpet. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find a solution to your auto parts needs. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on under how did you hear about us box that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. All right, two more questions here. Then we'll wrap up things for the week here on Locked On Panthers. Got a Friday mailbag question from Ken or Kendrick. Um, so Ken or Kendrick. Let's go with Kendrick this week from Kendrick. I've definitely enjoyed your show during this dry season. I'm really feeling like I'm in, on an island within the fan base right now. From everything that has been done, it really appears to me that, that they're building a solid team that can actually can be competitive this year. We all know about our little quarterback issue, but what am I missing? The assistant coaches are much stronger than they've been in the in years. The players all seem to be bought in on the head coach. The roster is stronger than it has been in years. Have we, the fans, sunk to Detroit level and no longer can see the good? Bonus question. I have three surefire Hall of Fame candidates that were true Panthers out of 90, 89, 59. Which player do you believe gets in first? So to answer your first question, I, I don't know how much negativity there truly is surrounding this, fan, this uh, organization and really the fan base. You go on Twitter, you're only going to find mostly negative things. Um, and like... I, I'm not going to say that I don't like add to it. Like a lot of times I'm more so like joking. Like I'm not going to take this that seriously. Like I like this team, um, but they're not going to ruin my day if they lose on Sundays. Uh, but still, I want them to be successful because it means a great deal to a lot of people. And it'd be way more fun to do this podcast and talk to you on a daily basis. If we're talking about a team that we enjoy watching the team that's winning. But Scott Fitter's done a really good job. He fixed the offensive line. He brought in a young quarterback prospect that people can wrap their arms around and believe in, which I thought was one of the biggest mistakes that Matt Rule did when he first came here. Getting rid of Cam, fine, get rid of him. But if you're going to bring somebody in, bring in a young guy that people can put their hopes and dreams in and think that maybe they can lead him to the promised land, which he didn't do over the first two years. But you can try and talk yourself into Teddy Bridgewater if you want, but he was Teddy was who he was in 2020, how he's been his entire career. And you can talk yourself into Sam Darnold if you want, but that was always stupid because Sam Darnold was never good in New York. And we saw last year, hasn't been good in Carolina. And it, I know there's extenuating circumstances and why he hasn't been able to play well, but it all comes between the years. It's on Sam Darnold for the most part, why he has not played well. And he was admitted that. And I'm sure internally he looks at his situations and thinks like, man, like if I had it better, maybe I'd play better, but still he's got to be better. The assistant coaches, you bring back Steve Wilkes, who is, I, I don't know of a beloved figure, but he's a guy who used to be here, of course, as defensive coordinator, ran a very aggressive scheme, then became the head coach in Arizona. So he has that experience. You have Chris Tabor, who's been an interim head coach and who always has a great special teams unit. And I saw a video of him from this past week where he's a very active coach running with the guys and being vocal. You love to see that. Paul Pascaloni is now old school guy running the defensive line. He's been a head coach back in college at Syracuse. He has been in the, in the football his entire life. And Ben McAdoo, whether he is a rock star OC or not, has a ton of experience in his evaluation of quarterbacks seems to be pretty damn darn spot on. So uh, yeah, they're, they're, they've gotten better. You've re-signed Dante. You've extended DJ Moore. There's been a lot of positive things, but oftentimes you're going to look at it at quarterback, which is, the most important position in football, and Christian McCaffrey is right. The quarterback and head coach get way too much of the credit and way too much of the blame. Absolutely. And I think we've done a good job at having a nuanced look at it, whether it's been y'all or me, when the conversations that we've had and looking and seeing why has the quarterback struggled? What are the other aspects of this roster that are the reason why the Carolina Panthers have lost? We haven't just said oh, it was only the quarterback. We, we look at the offensive line. We look at the, how the wide receivers have played. We looked at a lot of position groups, and we looked at the defense in the same way and seeing like why this team – has not played the way that way they want that we want them to play. But all that being said, like they're in a good position. It takes time. And I don't really want to hear, and I know y'all don't want either about a five year process or a six year process, but it does take time. And we did not see it in the win loss column last year, but they did improve on defense and they did find a kicker in Zane Gonzalez. Now we have to see if we can follow it up this upcoming season. But there were aspects of that team that were concerns and question marks going into the last year. 
that they were completely solved by the end of the season. Now there's other larger ones like offensive line and quarterback that weren't solved, but then have been solved. It looks like at least on paper with offensive line and quarterback is to be determined whether Sam Donald improves and plays to his draft position or if Matt Corral becomes the guy at the end of the, at the end of the day. So I look at this organization as, I mean, at least what Scott Fitterer has done, put your faith in him. I think he's doing a good job. And Matt, the way Matt rule, that is the way that he's talked about his players and the way he's really trying to get close with them and bond with them, which he hasn't had much of an opportunity to do because of COVID the last two years. Like I'm kind of cutting him some slack and Roman Harper, who we talked about to about a month ago. I mean, he looked at it as he didn't have any expectations for the Panthers first two years. Like, I don't know what people expected in 2020, but yet every Sunday I'm seeing how people are mad as heck about Teddy Bridgewater. It just, why are you doing this to yourself? And then last year you get excited about the 3-0 start. And I had I had higher expectations in 5-12 and 12 as well. But it's just at some point in time, it's like you have to manage your expectations. Like the Panthers, it's not like they're coming out with all this like Super Bowl talk and then they're falling flat on their face. They were a young team with guys like Jeremy Chin and Brian Burns and DJ Moore and Dante Jackson and Christian McCaffrey and Shaq Thompson who like have not seen success. You have to learn how to win. It takes time to get there. And even when they get to the playoffs, like I had someone ask me about how this team compares to Seattle 10 years ago. That Seahawks team built to getting to the Super Bowl in back-to-back years and winning it in the, in one of, in the first year and then getting very close. and should, should have won it um, that other year against Patriots and Malcolm Butler had the interception. Like it wasn't just Seattle – all of a sudden, after two years, playoff team, and then we're in a Super Bowl. It takes time. So I've tried to preach patience. Like I have my doubts about Matt Rule. I certainly do. And I feel in sharing your concerns about this organization, but it could always be worse. And it's certainly not as, as, as bad as you might see people reacting to on Twitter. Like the Tepper thing, like I don't have, I don't trust that guy at all. He can get better as an owner as long as he lets people do their jobs and hires the right people. The soccer team, they're winning. It's a good environment. It's been really weird how you've seen a technical director, Mark Nichols, leave before the season even starts. And they fired the head coach, even though it makes a lot of sense if you've read the reporting of why they moved on from him. But still, it, it, there's some question marks there. But it's an exciting product. I don't think there's a lot of expectation. With the Panthers, though, a whole different b- monster. The team hasn't been in the playoffs since 2017. They've been flat out bad since you've been here. There's reasons for that. Mainly quarterback play and injuries and all that. What happened with Cam Newton and then just bringing in a young coach. But it takes time. And if we don't see the results after this, this, this upcoming season, then, yeah, it would make a lot more sense to me for people to be extremely mad. But 2020 to be mad after every game made no sense. People were like, oh, I didn't think we would be competitive. It's the NFL. This isn't the ACC. You're not like, you're not Syracuse getting blown out by Clemson. Like, that's just not what happens in the NFL. These guys are pros. They get paid, too. It just takes time. So, again, take, take, take a deep breath every once in a while and realize that, hey, this team is not – they're not that far away. They're not a quarterback away. They're not that far away, though. I just I feel like if not this season where they I at least I know it sucks, but 2023 really feels like a, and they should have been in position now and they might be. I still I still think they're going to be a team that gets right there and has a chance depending on how things go. But at the very least, like they're definitely going to be there next year, in my opinion. Um, and then to answer bonus question, uh, the surefire Hall of Fame candidates that were Panthers out of 90, which is Julius Peppers, 89, which is Steve Smith Sr. in 59, which is Luke Keekley, which player gets in first? Well, Julius Peppers is going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Um, he's not eligible until 2024. And Luke Keekley might not go in first time, but at least second time, he's not eligible until 2025. Steve Smith is already eligible, was not a finalist this past year, but he has two years to get in. And I would think before 2024, Either this upcoming year or 2023, I do think Steve Smith Sr. will be a Hall of Famer. Look at all the wide receivers ahead of him, and even I think one of them behind him. Um, who, and they're all t- on the all time re- um, list on receiving yards. Everyone above Steve Smith is in the Hall of Fame. Steve Smith Sr. is going to the Hall of Fame, just a matter of when. And I think it will be before, hopefully, Peppers is eligible and the same thing with Keekley being eligible. So I'm going to say Steve Smith Sr. Uh, and then final question here, Kyle, I didn't get to this one last week, um, but Kyle, Asked, how do you feel about the Panthers being ranked the lowest in Madden? I know it's only a game, but still, how are we 72 talent wise and the Texans are 74? I saw Sam Darnold apparently is going to be a 69, nice, but not really at quarterback this upcoming year. He has the worst rating of any starting quarterback, which, hey, Madden is only going based off of what, act, what reality is. 
I don't know if that's the case with the team. It's also a video game. So how, how do I feel about it? Uh, quite honestly, I don't care. <laughs> um, not to be rude, but it's, I don't even play. I don't even realize I played Madden. Bring back the NCAA football game. We'll start playing video games again. But I don't care what the Madden rating is. None of that matters. So let's hope the uh, the team, as we've seen, which has been built, actually can perform once we get onto the field later on this year. All right, so that's going to wrap up this edition of the Lockdown Panthers podcast, a part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, hosted by yours truly, Julian Council. Again, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show over on all your favorite podcasting platforms, and check us out on YouTube where you subscribe to the episode. We're on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays moving forward here until we get down to training camp and we're back on our daily schedule. So again, make sure to subscribe on all those places, YouTube, and wherever you listen to the podcast, you don't miss a single episode throughout the next couple of weeks here on Locked on Panthers as the Panthers have a five-week hiatus, but we don't have a five-week hiatus. We'll have less episodes, but we'll still have shows here on the podcast. And be sure to follow me on Twitter at Julian Count so we can check out all the Panthers news and whatever thoughts I have on care on the Panthers, sports here in North Carolina, and just whatever general musings I have about what I want to tweet about. I don't know. Um, so do that. But more importantly, you want to do it so you can at me or DM me really just DM me on Twitter at Julian Council so you can participate on the weekly Friday mailbag, which we do every single Friday, unless it's a holiday, but there's no holidays coming up that are occurring on a Friday. So be there for every single weekly Friday mailbag because I love to hear from you guys. That's your best way to interact with the show. So please go ahead and do that by DMing me at Julian Council over on Twitter. In the meantime, stay safe. Enjoy your weekend. It's kind of cooling off, but not really. But either way, enjoy your weekend. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there that listen to the show. Thank you so much for your support. And for everyone who listens to the show, thank you so much for your support. As we've grown on YouTube, we've grown over the year. I've been doing this, and I really appreciate uh, being able to have a voice here to all the Carolina Panther fans and y'all supporting the show. So, again, have a great weekend. And as always, keep pounding. And I will talk to y'all on Monday, where we'll talk to Nick Carboni and wrap up mandatory minicamp officially.